marries a Lakota woman, has children with the Lakota women, goes to war against the Crow. His culture is Lakota. His birth line is Crow. One learns culture. One learns culture. We express culture in our views, our attitudes, and behaviors, and we'll see that, this and, and know that with each other. And sometimes we think about it in categories. I, I'm hoping by the end of this day you will be highly discouraged to do that, to not think of African-American culture or Asian culture, Asia, well, lots of countries in Asia, um, lots of languages. Uh, African-Americans, people from many different places of the world come together to say we are of African descent, um, often individually defined. Keep that point in mind. Oops. A little bit too I'm better away. You can tell I'm of technology of a different time. <laughs> and so, we're going to do an exercise together. Um, if we had more time, I'd ask you to really exercise and get up and move around the room, but we won't do that. And so I just want you to look at this slide, and you're going to think quietly sitting in your seat to yourself first and answer these questions. Um, these are some of the elements that uh, we often talk about when we think about culture and the things that make up our complicated, multi-layered identities. And I want you now to each stop, look at me, and look at each of these, and write down a little piece of paper and answer to each of those. Okay, I'm going to give you... 30 seconds, you don't need more than that. <laughs> and I'll stand over here so you can see me. Okay, raise your hand when you're finished. Raise your hand when you're finished. Raise your hands when you're finished. You know, finished could mean a lot of things. Finished could mean you've answered every single one, you've been the great student. The other could be finished, I can't answer any of the questions, you're the great student. It could be, I don't want to do this exercise, I'm the great student. So, how many people are finished? Great. I thought that might be the case. So um, is there a brave human being who would just want to stand up and do this exercise with me? Is there a brave faculty member <laughs> who would want to stand and do this? All right. So then in the interest of time, and since I, I, I've never liked it when someone has pulled me out of an audience to do something, absolutely never, I will just give you what I hope you know is the point of this exercise. Um, I'll answer a few of these for you. I'm African American. My eyes are blue, my hair is blonde, I'm African American. My religion, I think you'd have to ask me that, yes? I happen to be Catholic. Um, my sex, my age, my size. I don't think I want to tell you my age, but <laughs> you'd have to ask me. Primary language. You'd have to ask me. You could assume it was English, but you'd have to ask me. And on and on. And so this is just an example. And we could go, the list is really quite lengthy, of elements that contribute to our makeup and our description of ourselves as cultural being, beings that we really, in our best circumstances, must ask the person we're with to know for sure. Assumption, not a good thing. My father taught me that when I was very young. So here you are going to do this with someone else. We won't talk it out loud, or unless there's a brave person. Um, I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to listen and talk with each other just for about two minutes about when you first felt different, what culture had to do with this, and to name the elements of culture that were at play here, such as values, beliefs, learned patterns of behavior. I'm asking you to do this now because when I asked if you had had deep conversations about culture, almost all of you raised your hands. So have this moment, use this time, have that conversation with the person next to you, that stranger next to you. 
Okay? Let's go. in the room, I can hear it, time to stop. I see it took a while for some people to get started, but once you got started, I can, I can tell people we'll talk for many, many minutes here. Some will, some will not. So just to give you an idea of what this means, what the cultural experience is, how it feels like, and that we, it's important for us to, again, be certain we can do for ourselves what we are asking of others as we enter into dialogue with patients about issues of culture. So, the rest of this afternoon, you'll be spending together in groups where you will be looking at cases and, and learning, being introduced to some of you for a second or third time, different ways of uh, interviewing patients, of being in dialogue with patients. So you're going to be engaged in what I would call skills development, um, learning tools, actually making practical these theoretical ideas and this kind of general conversation you've been having so far. I think it's exceptional. I think it's completely important. Um, I'm going to offer you in the next 15 minutes a frame to hold that in that I think and other colleagues across the country think is useful for us to use as we move into our work in the next decade, two decades, around being certain that issues of culture and difference are in fact at the center of our work as we practice, as we do the work, our piece of work, which is one part of our work to eliminate racial and ethnic health disparities. So this is to talk about cultural humility. The term cultural humility really came out of the work that started in 1992 at Children's Hospital in Oakland when we had a sentinel event in the hospital. Uh, Rodney King was beaten in California and in our particular children's hospital, it was nigh on impossible for staff and patients to carry on even respectful interchanges because of the hostility that had been created around that particular incident in the state of California. What came to the fore was that people began to say in, in, in different ways and in different conversations that Children's Hospital had to examine its own private Rodney Kings and that it was important for us to understand and learn about the communities which we served, who in fact paid our mortgages, oh by the way, um, what, what exactly were we doing or not doing that made sense for families, that actually contributed to good health outcomes? And so we developed this program, the Multicultural Curriculum Program, centered on the community teaches. And it was about the same time that the, the term cultural competence was coming to the fore. And a community member, Leland Brown, said, I can't, I can't hold on to that term. It's not helping me. I don't get what it means. And he presented us with this, that instead we should think about it as cultural humility, that this whole process is not a discrete endpoint. We are not going to reach the end, but it's a commitment, an active engagement, and a lifelong process that individuals enter into over and over and over again with patients, with communities, with colleagues, and with themselves. That's where the term comes from. And I remind you again that for us in the three years of the program, four years of the program that um, we worked together, we learned what this meant in a very profound way through community members who taught us. This is an example of a community member 